Hi, my name is Emily Turkin and I'm the Screen Time Consultant. Thanks for joining me again today. Last time we talked about habit forming design and what makes something a habit forming design element. Sometimes that's also called persuasive design or persuasive technologies. And in my opinion, it's one of the most important things that parents, educators, and anyone who works with children or technology needs to understand. A lot of times people will say, okay, so what? What's the big deal? I know that it's addictive, or I know that there are ways that hook my attention and hold it. I don't see what the big problem is. The problem is that by themselves, these individual things maybe aren't problematic, but when they're combined skillfully to really hook and hold our attention, they become manipulative and we can still fall prey to their powers and become targets of a well-funded marketing industry. For adults, we have some control over that, but for children whose brains are not yet fully developed, this is especially problematic in my opinion. So today we're gonna to talk about some examples of habit forming design. Some of them will be really familiar to you and some of them might be sort of more obscure. If you recognize yourself as somebody experiencing one or more of these in your daily life, it's good to know about it and understand it so you can help pay attention and prevent yourself from getting sucked in more than you want. One really popular example of habit forming or persuasive design is free to play or freemium. Video games like Fortnite use what's called a freemium model. This would be hooking us in because it's quote unquote free and then having in-app or in-game charges start to compile and rack up. One mom told me about her own child racking up $600 in Fortnite expenses and she was only alerted to it after the um, Visa credit card company called her and said, did you spend this much money in Fortnite? I like to refer to this as the high cost of free. Popular mobile apps are another great example of freemium or free to play. Wordscapes, Homescapes, Fishdom, even Solitaire, all of those free downloadable things that offer hundreds of levels of play that increase in complexity. Points often are accumulated to achieve bonus items or purchase bonus items, or you can play, players can purchase items within the game using real credit cards. So it could be in-game purchases using accumulated points or real dollars because our credit card is attached to the app store. Homescapes, which you might've seen as pop-up ads in other games, is a really popular version of this model. The main character, Austin, moves back in with his family to help them restore a family estate. To do this, the player has to participate and solve a bunch of puzzles in order to get new pieces of furniture, install new appliances, or clean up messes. Every time you fail or don't achieve the level, you lose a heart. Once you've used up all your allotted hearts, you must wait 20 to 40 minutes per restored heart, or you can purchase additional lives to get back into the game faster. You're also given the option to purchase packs of bonus items that help you beat levels while you're stuck in the level. Let's talk about Animal Jam. This has been one of my daughter's favorite games and I have got some issues with it. It's another game that uses the freemium model. And unfortunately, she's been begging me for an Animal Jam membership. Though the game was free to play, a membership costs nearly $60 a year. I hear about her need to collect gems and trade items within the game with other jammers, kids who are playing, well, presumably children who are playing this game. She puts on fashion shows using her avatars and items she's bought with her gems, and she buys furniture for virtual rooms. It's strange. A quick perusal of one-star reviews, which is always something I enjoy doing to see what people's most egregious criticisms are of different games and apps, says that once you've moved on to other apps, it's actually really difficult to quit Animal Jam, that parents continue to be charged for fees and attempts to cancel memberships nearly impossible. Other freemium tactics include annoying customers with ads until they purchase something, an upgrade or in-app stuff, locking certain levels until you've achieved a level or purchased certain items, and offering special characters, themes, outfits, or skins for additional purchases. I know that's a common one in Fortnite in particular. Strategies appeal to our desire for social approval, right? Or our sense that we might be missing out if we don't have this thing or this skin or this character or this device or this gem. Push notifications and spam email remind us that we are missing out and our friends are lonely and want us to come back and play. Using these techniques to guilt or shame us into playing is manipulative behavioral design at its worst. Another technique is called moving goalposts. Players are offered new incentives 
incentives to keep playing, even if they've already compulsively obtained every upgrade possible. One example of a moving goalpost is an expansion pack. In the game World of Warcraft regularly releases expansion packs that offer new challenges and opportunities to gain experience. Players are never able to keep their expert status because the game is constantly changing. Fortnite does a slight variation of this with the seasons. At the end of a season, a player's status is reset. They keep their upgrades, but points for the season start at zero. If they want to retain their community status, they need to start playing again with everyone else. Even the word puzzles I sometimes like to play reset daily, but tantalizingly offer me a chance to check yesterday's score to see how well I matched up. A third technique is called progress bars. Progress bars have been around since the first arcade games. They were used to show the progress on a level. And today they're used more extensively in role-playing games to level up different character aspects. A character may have three separate bars for vitality, magic, and strength. Having multiple bars means that one of their attributes is close to the next level, making it hard for users to quit with a nearly finished goal post in sight. Badges and leaderboards are another example of progress bars. They also introduce a community element by making it clear when you're one of the only players to achieve a certain level or a badge. For example, the increasingly popular Peloton bike uses a leaderboard. This compares your progress with other riders, either live or ones who've ridden previously. Sometimes this number is in the tens of thousands of people. All of these, plus other milestones that you can achieve, encourage continued participation. For example, when you reach 100 rides, you get a free t-shirt. Some games like Gears of War layer on multiple methods of leveling up. Once a player hits 100, they can reset their status to achieve more specialized badges. Another example is social gaming. One of the most effective ways to keep people engaged in a game or app is to make them feel like their participation really matters to the other people playing and that if you don't play, you're somehow letting other people down. World of Warcraft bands people together with different specialties to make a well-rounded unit. If the group doesn't have a healer online, for example, they're probably not gonna run a difficult mission. If you're one of the critical players, it's hard to back out of playing. Call of Duty, Gears of War, and even Candy Crush, Words with Friends, and Farmville all encourage people to invite their friends and share on social media. Many games encourage collaboration. I knew one woman who was in charge of hundreds of guild members in World of Warcraft and avoided a full-time corporate job to maintain her position. For anyone who knows a Snapchat user, snap streaks are another way users are pitted against one another to keep players or users on. Teens and tweens craving social attention, which is developmentally appropriate, are rewarded for maintaining their streaks or daily posts in Snapchat. Fear of breaking the streak can lead to teens begging their parents to have access to Snapchat on vacations or paranoia about missing out or extreme anxiety that affects their ability to focus on other things like school. Max Stossel of the Center for Humane Tech often shares a video clip when he gives talks about a talk he did at a high school. When he asks the kids in the audience, pre-COVID, of course, how many of them use Snapchat, nearly every kid in the audience raises their hand. Then he asks them to keep their hands up if they use streaks. Most hands stay up. Then he asks, keep your hands up if you like streaks. Most hands drop. Social feedback, another form of persuasive design. We've all become used to receiving instant feedback on our social media feeds, whether that's likes or comments. Now we have other choices like thumbs up or hugs angry face. We like likes. And of course, as a result, we're driven even more to create more content to generate more likes and more approval. And even when those responses are positive or encouraging, it's really easy to get fixated on the one negative or the one contrary or the one thumbs down part that sticks in your brain and makes you feel bad and asks questions about why did I post that? And why did that person react that way? Why did they like it and not love it? The fitness app Strava is another example of social feedback. Strava allows runners and cyclists to track their mileage, post their routes and times and offer kudos to each other. It also displays the best time holder for routes broken up in small increments. A runner gets an alert each time they break a record or if their record is subsequently broken. For those with competitive athletic drive, this can drive forms of exercise addiction, seeking stronger stats 
versus health benefits. Some video games offer more immediate social feedback with audio parties of connected players. For example, in Call of Duty, players can coordinate attacks. The newly popular game Among Us also encourages players to communicate with each other and strategize to find the imposter. You know how adults are always asking kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? That may be a pretty loaded question to put to a nine-year-old, but what I've noticed is how many kids now will answer that question with, I want to be a YouTube star, or I want to be a social media influencer. In our childhood, kids might have dreamed of becoming the next NBA star or movie celebrity. Of course, most of us didn't attain that, but in order to try to attain that, we had to spend hours on the basketball court or in drama club or performing on stage. There was a lot of effort that would go into that and had the positive side benefit of being good for us and social and physical exercise and outdoors. Being a YouTube star requires a different level of commitment, like a huge time investment, the right equipment and a crew of people to feed the content engine, plus the need to be online constantly and posting regularly, if not daily, multiple times a day. To spend all this time trying to be an aspirational YouTube star isn't the same thing as trying to be the next LeBron. There's a different effect on our bodies and brains when we sit in front of our computer and upload to YouTube all the time versus when we're out on the basketball court really pounding the pavement trying to get more skilled at basketball. And you can tell I don't play a lot of basketball because I'm not sure I'm even using those sports metaphors correctly. But I know that it's really different for my brain and body to be out there playing basketball than to be on YouTube. Infinite scrolling, another technique. Most people don't make it past the first page of Google search results, but we'll lose track of time scrolling through Instagram. We stop on the first page of Google for two reasons. One, it has an end. We have to click next page to go on. And two, we know that the probability of a match for what we're looking for decreases the further we stray from the first result. Of course, there's algorithms driving those search results, which is a different video. On the other hand, there's no end to our Instagram or Twitter feed, and the content is refreshed instantaneously. We can literally scroll forever and never run out. Infinite scroll is powerful. It gives us a visual reward to keep spinning through content. We're always gonna have something new. And of course we see enough things that we like and are incentivized to keep scrolling. And because we know there's no end, we just keep going. Another technique is refresh prompts. Have you ever tried to buy tickets for an event at the last minute? Chances are you've received a busy server message from the ticket vendor encouraging you to refresh often, which of course you did and do over and over. That FOMO or fear of missing out is also used on various social media platforms to keep us on. LinkedIn will helpfully prompt you to refresh for the latest posts. Facebook does the same thing. And you know that pulling down on that Instagram feed will result in more items. Another technique is push notification. If you've watched the Social Dilemma documentary, you know that social applications have gotten very sophisticated. They monitor our moods and how long we interact with certain content so they can serve us up the right ads at the right time. They know how long we hover over a post or which videos we interact with. They know how often we use which emojis and which friends posts we prefer to see. All of this allows companies and applications to direct our usage. If push notifications are enabled, you'll notice prompts popping up if you've been idle for longer than usual. If you have a business page, Facebook and Instagram will go so far as to offer you free advertising to encourage you to post again soon. Unlike the days of BlackBerry in its download content drops, we didn't start obsessively picking up our phones and checking for notifications until they started happening at random intervals. Psychologists call this intermittent variable rewards. Because things don't come at regular intervals, they're unpredictable, and therefore we keep going back to search, refresh, upload, scroll to see if we might have a new alert, message, comment, post. Push notifications have become the perfect variable reward to hook and hold our attention for longer periods. On its own, each habit forming design technique may not appear threatening, but look at it from the perspective of a developer. What are they trying to get you to do? What prompts are they using to get you to engage with an action? And what do they gain by keeping you engaged? Chances are you'll see multiple design elements competing to keep you on longer, your attention becomes a commodity that lines the pockets of wealthy technology companies. As Yale computer scientist Edward Tufte has noted, there are only two industries that call their customers users, illegal drugs and software. We would be wise to pay attention. Thank you very much for watching. I have more videos on my YouTube channel and you can find more about me at my website, thescreentimeconsultant.com. Thanks. And make us by having us live. Was that too much looking up and down? Sorry. <laughs>
And what are the things that make that wordscapes, fish homes, home? And even when we're, okay. Yeah, players, badgers, not badgers. Badges and leaderboards are another example of moving goalposts. No, progress bars. A small percentage of players to perch to complete the batch. Ha! Huh. Gives ego play. No. <laughs> when you reach 100 miles, you get a free teacher. No, not a free teacher. Oh my God. Players with different specialities. Specialities. World of Warcraft bands together people. People. Oh my God. <laughs> 